Greg Williams is a leading authority on global technology trends and how they impact business and society. As executive editor of Wired magazine, Greg meets the innovators, thinkers, scientists, entrepreneurs, and creatives who are changing the world, and writes on a variety of subjects, including innovation, technology, business, creativity, and ideas. As a journalist and author of five novels, Greg possesses a unique combination of storytelling expertise and in-depth knowledge of the future of technology and entrepreneurship. This enables him to transform complex information into entertaining and accessible insights that prepare audiences for what's coming next. Greg's latest book on big data will be released shortly. Greg has delivered keynote speeches at technology and corporate events, educational institutions, and consults for several advertising agencies. At Wired, he is constantly on the lookout for world-changing technologies, ideas, companies, and transformative trends. So hi everyone, I'm Greg Williams from Wired, and uh, as the intro said, I have a pretty fun job. So I get to spend my days uh, talking to the people who are really kind of thinking about what's coming next. So the entrepreneurs, the investors, the, um, uh, the scientists, the business people, who are really trying to sort of get to grips with the trends that are going to be affecting the world in the coming years. Um, but before we kind of get into this kind of whole notion about openness and data that I'd kind of like to share with you today, um, I just want to kind of give us a little bit of context, because I think it's important to maybe see kind of where we are. So here's an image of three people I know you'll recognize. The first three human beings are on the moon, uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin. Anyone know the third one? Michael Collins, the guy in the middle, didn't actually get to walk on the moon. He got to go around the other side on his, on his own. So from the perspective of 2016, I think it's really, really easy to forget how incredibly hard some of the kind of technological and some of the engineering challenges they overcame. The fact that they had to get these people 380,000 kilometers to the moon and back with these tiny, tiny event windows, and it could have been a catastrophe. When Eagle landed on the moon, it only had 25 seconds worth of fuel left in its tanks. Uh, William Safai, who was President Nixon's speechwriter at that time, had already written a letter to the world talking about the fact that these three guys had been lost. Huge risks. This is what got them there. This is the Apollo guidance computer display and keyboard interface. It weighs about 70 pounds. It's got a processor that was a processor speed of about one megahertz uh, and a memory of around four kilobytes. Uh, programmed by a woman uh, called Margaret Hamilton at MIT. And it costs hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to build. And I'd like to contrast that with something that's completely normal now. I've got one in my pocket. It is switched off. Um, I always remember to do that before I, before I give a speak. Weighs 3.9 ounces, sorry, 9.5 ounces. Processor speed, uh, 1.4 gigahertz. Memory, 64 gigabytes. Uh, and it cost me around $350. So math fans in the audience will have realized by now that I have around 1,400 times more processing power in my pocket than NASA did back in July 1969. And what that means by extension is that any of you have a smart, who have a smartphone, and I find it hard to believe that any of you in this room don't have a smartphone, will have more processing power in your pocket than Apollo 11 did back then. So we're in the mobile internet era now. The only thing we know for absolute sure is that over the next few years, we're gonna see relentless change driven by data-centric technologies that's gonna allow us to do business and understand the world in entirely new ways. The relationship between bits and atoms is getting very, very complicated, but it's only gonna speed up. It's accelerating. As the president just said, things are never gonna move this slowly again. This is a, a you know, talking about data. Um, this is a kind of like, I'm sure you've heard stats like this. 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years. This offers us some context of where we're going. Uh, by 2020, it's gonna have uh, quadrupled. So I'm sure that some of you in this room might be familiar with Moore's Law, which is a basic law of computing, which is that processing power doubles or halves in price every 18 months. And what that means is that growth in technology is no longer linear. It's no longer incremental. It's exponential. It's that graph. It's that steep now. And that is bringing about a fundamental change in the nature of information and the way that we 
do business. So we know, now have internet connected meters uh, for smart metering. We now have automation in healthcare, automation in all kinds of other industries, including telecommunications, robotics in manufacturing, black box trading in the finance industry. We have machine learning, natural language processing, artificial intelligence, machine to machine systems that communicate over the internet without the mediation of human beings. Fundamentally, today, we are now living inside a network. So our homes, our jobs, our cars, increasingly our bodies are connected to the internet in real time on a highly, highly individualized basis. So the key points that I'd like to kind of emphasize in the next sort of 10, 15 minutes, digital means that every organization, every business today is a technology company. It's completely shifted the customer mindset. Expectation has gone up, and it's only going in one direction. There is no kind of sense of like business as usual. That's gone. The president talked about Kodak, and that's a great example. It dominated its, its field until, until relatively recently, when, um, uh, when it was disrupted by Instagram. Instagram employed just 18 people. So there's no such thing as business as usual any longer an incumbent can be challenged by a small, agile competitor. Digital now means that innovation is a necessity. We have to adapt to the new, and it means we have to be open. We have to collaborate. We have to work with people within our organizations, but also on the outside as well, and that's tough for some people. So let's take that first point. Every organization is a technology business, and I think that that's absolutely true. Think about Amazon. Is Amazon an e-commerce business or is it a technology company? Is Netflix, is Netflix an entertainment company or is it a technology company? What's Uber today? Is Uber a uh, transportation company or is it a technology business? What is a bank in the era of the smartphone? What's a car company, an automotive company in the age of the autonomous vehicle? So how do we adapt and face these challenges to our business? How do we keep pace with this relentless change? Well, we don't know exactly what the devices of the future are going to be. We don't know exactly what the operating systems of the future are going to be. But we do know that um, our connected devices have become our primary interface with the world. And the services that we consume on them are now central to the modern world. Today, mobile is uh, as a platform is worth around three trillion US. That's only going to increase to around 4.6 billion subscribers globally in 2020. But let's take a little bit of a, a step back, and you'll see where I'm going hopefully in a minute with this. So, 2007, year zero for the app economy. The iPhones introduced, 3G comes the same year. A year later, Apple opened the App Store. Right. This is a very very important moments. Three months later, uh, Google opened its own kind of version of that. It was called Android Market. It's now known as Google Play. Others followed suit. Why was this important? Well, technology companies um, allowing kind of third parties to build services that could be downloaded onto their platform marked significant shift in the way that uh, business works. Why? Move from desktop to mobile. Okay, we know that. More importantly, a fundamental change in the way that goods and services are supplied. This is important, and a massive sea change in consumer behavior. But the key is, the key point to take away from this is that Apple succeeded by opening up its network so that others could build on top of it. Google did the same, Samsung did the same, others followed. So Apple net revenue in 2016 and this year will be around 216 billion US dollars. The number one contributor to this is the iPhone. The second biggest contributor is the services, the services that are built on top of that platform, delivering around six billion a quarter now. It's the fastest growing part of Apple's business. And I think that's really important. So let's think about the iPhone. Not a, it's actually not a great telephone. When I use mine, I it gets drop calls all the time. What's valuable to me are the products and the services that are built on top of it, the podcast, the gaming, the video, the messaging services as we were talking about Google Maps, so important. Wandering around Tokyo yesterday, I could not have got around without it. Those services are so valuable to me. So this is crucial. If we're to 
uh, manufacture successful hardware products. We need to realize that the piece of hardware is just one element of what will make us successful. It's not just about the hardware. It's about the ecosystem, everything else that you build around it. On-demand services like Uber, downloadable onto our phones, have completely altered this customer expectation. The opportunity is the richness of these offerings that we can build around the experience, how we can make them seamless, how we can make life easy for our consumers and our partners. So you might, might think that you're in the, so, uh, in the um, manufacturing business. You're also in the software business. You might think that you're in the hardware business. You are also in the service industry too. I think that's really important. Operating within a fast-paced, highly networked world means that consumers are constantly judging the experience they have with your brand. We live in a world where user experience is your brand today, right? Whatever channel is acting, your customer is acting with you on. So your, today, if your, competition, your competition is best in class, it doesn't matter what industry you're working in. So if you, you're a, a, a retailer, maybe you think that your competition is, I don't know, The Gap or Uniqlo or Amazon, something like that. What you actually have to do is think about all the brands that your consumer today is interacting with. So they're working, you know, they're, they're interacting with Starbucks, they're interacting with Emirates. The, they're interacting with Tokyo Bank or their local library or the coffee store that knows their order when they work, walk through the door. So you're being judged against every brand or service in the marketplace, whether they are a direct competitor or not. Is your user experience as good as Apple? Is your user experience as good as Netflix? Because today, it kind of has to be because your consumers are using those services. The other thing that consumers want more than anything they want things being done on their terms. And as the digital and the physical world become increasingly blurred, so consumers want to consume our products, not when it suits us, but when it suits them. See, so for instance, it seems likely that there uh, is gonna be a move away from car ownership. There's been a move away from ownership of all kinds of things, music, those kinds of things. We stream music, we stream movies. We pay for access to a next network. We were talking earlier about BMW. So the company now think of it describes itself as a mobility provider. And it's sort of foundation, they're talking about these, this acronym, ACES, A-C-E-S. And that stands for Autonomous Connected Electric, that's what I've been told, <laughs> uh, shared. And the, the vision is that maybe you might uh, buy a subscription to a BMW, a BMW subscription. So one day you walk, you make, walk up, sorry, wake up in the morning, you walk out of your house, and you decide, actually, I want to drive a Mini to the office this morning. And there's a Mini available in your street. You get in it, you drive. The next day, you've got a report to read. So you don't really want to drive yourself. So you call an autonomous vehicle on your smartphone. Maybe you're going out for dinner that evening with your partner. You want a nice, fancy car to drive you to the restaurant or to the theater. So you call that up. They come and they give you that service. The point I'm trying to make is that consumption models are changing. Consumers want to consume our products in very, very different ways. And we need to be aware that people want to consume and, and, and engage with our brands in ways that maybe don't fit our current business model. We have to be able to adapt and think about it. If you're a payment provider, how can you make it easy for people to make a payment at a gas station without leaving their vehicle? If you're, uh, you know, you run a restaurant, if you're in the hospitality business, if you know someone's coming to your restaurant, how can you help that person get a, get a, a, a parking space nearby, give them sort of some kind of uh, priority? So we need to be able to kind of join all these dots up. We need to be able to make lots of connections in a very complex world. One of the ways we can do that, we can leverage our data. So we spend a lot of time as I was saying earlier on, thinking about the, biz the data within our businesses. And that's right, you know, we can t tell a lot of things about how our business uh, is performing. But what a, a lot of businesses are now thinking about is the data outside their organizations. How can they tell what's coming next? How can they find opportunity from looking at that and examining that? So the open web has huge amounts of, of data on it. You can find all kinds of things, litigation. You can find patent applications. You can find visa applications. Google AdWords is a really interesting uh, uh, way of finding out what's happening in the world. So all these different sources, visa applications is an interesting one. 
So analyzing exogenous data, external data, won't tell us exactly what's happening in the world, but it gives us indications. It gives us kind of a sense of, 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 of signals. Some we might not understand at first, but we can, we can test hypotheses about what it might mean. And we can use these set, uh, sources in all kinds of predictive and interesting ways. One company that's done this in the United States is Zappos. So uh, it's a shoe, it sells shoes, uh, grew to be the biggest uh, um, e-commerce site for shoes in the world, uh, sold to Amazon for 1.2 billion. And one of the most interesting things I think about that company is that the founder, Tony Shea, put a really interesting metric at the heart of the company. That metric was happiness. The happiness of the people who work there and the happiness of its customers. It's a customer service. And it's quite an, un an unusual metric, especially in something like e-commerce, which is a very low margin, very sharp elbowed business. But Shea articulated this in a way that was really interesting, I think. He described the company as a service company. It just happened to sell shoes. And what's interesting is that being number one in customer service isn't an internal metric. It's not like saying we're going to increase revenue by 5% over the next six months. It's a measure that can only be determined comparatively by using exogenous data. There can be plenty of companies that have had a revenue increase of 5% in the last six months, but there can only be one that's number one in customer service. So increasingly, we're going to start using kind of exogenous external data to tell us what's coming next. This is happening in, in, in the car, in the world of uh, automotive as well. Natural language processing startups. Uh, I, I spoke to one in California a few months ago. He can predict monthly sales of cars in the United States with about 90% accuracy simply by looking at what people are saying on social media. It's an incredibly reliable way of figuring out the way people are thinking. So we need to be thinking about opportunity outside our walls and, uh, and to improve collaboration with others inside our organization as well. One company that does this really well, I think, is, is General Electric, biggest industrial company in the world, optimized for large-scale efficiency, squeezes out inefficiency and waste from huge, huge production runs. Generally, the company will not build a product unless it's doing around 50,000 units a year. So this is great for churning out products in a really highly established market where you know exactly what people want, but it's no good for innovation. It's like a battleship. It takes a while to get going, it takes a while to stop, very, very hard to change direction. General Electric, generally, when they're running a large-scale kind of production, it takes them two and a half years from the idea through to the finished object to bring it to market. So they're trying something very different. It's called first build, and it's an experiment that relies on what's known as open innovation. And that basically just means getting ideas from outside, getting external ideas into your company's own walls. And with additive manufacturing or 3D printing now, they can build products at a relatively low volume, especially for them. And they're combining this with crowdfunding, which I think is a really interesting model. They're getting a passionate, self-selecting market of consumers who are willing to buy something. They know they're willing to buy something before it's even been built. This is, this is very important. They have a facility, this is here, near Louisville in Kentucky. And uh, one example is that they, there was a lot of enthusiasm that they would build a product, uh, a countertop product that manufactured nugget ice. Now, nugget ice is very, very small pieces of ice, very popular in the southern states of the United States. Um, designs were uh, submitted online. A winner was selected. And what they did next was really interesting. They put the idea on the crowdfunding pro uh, platform Indiegogo, right? So people could decide whether they wanted to, to, to invest in it. They raised, raised 2.6 million US dollars. So that's an interesting thing, right? That product was developed by the company opening up to see what people wanted. People told them what they wanted. They raised the money for it without even producing anything. They had the money in the bank before they even, um, before they even started manu manufacturing anything, simply because they allowed the people, the market, to participate in that innovation process. Another interesting kind of uh, company is a company called Kaggle, which some of you might have kind of played around on. It's basically a predictive model, uh, modeling and analytics kind of competition platform. Um, companies and researchers post huge amounts of data on it, and then they ask statisticians and data miners to, to look at that data and to compete 
and to uh, figure out the best model to uh, provide it, uh, efficiencies. There's over half a million people who go on this platform, uh, 194 countries are participating. The prizes are really substantial. There's one healthcare company put $3 million prize up, uh, which was won uh, by someone, I think, in, think in, uh, in New York. And they cover a whole wide variety of areas. So healthcare companies will put uh, uh, challenges up there. Aviation companies will put uh, challenges up there. April 2015, they also released a product onto their platform that allows users to write, run, publicly share code. It's huge amounts of data on there. They've released more product that allows them, people to uh, actually put public data sets and make those available so people to can play around with those. Another interesting one, the X Prize. Uh, it's a $30 million prize for the first people who can get, 16 teams are competing to get a uh, vehicle onto the moon, drive it for 15 meters, uh, sorry, 50, five zero meters, and then send high definition Im uh, images back to Earth. And what's interesting is that these people, these are private companies, right, that are all trying to do this. They're trying to win this prize. Previously, only governments attempted to do this kind of thing. So entrepreneurs and small companies are taking on these incredibly grand challenges, these incredibly big and interesting projects. So technology means that innovation is no longer kind of solely the realm of well-resourced co uh, companies. This is an open source car. It was put together by kind of people all over the world who got together and they, they figured out how to open source a car. You can buy it online for around $4,000. They will ship it to your house. They claim you will be able to assemble it in an hour. I don't believe anyone who's visited IKEA will know that is definitely not the case. But big companies are doing it too. Tesla's a great uh, ex example of this. Um, the electric car company in 2014 opened up all its patents, made them available to anyone. Anyone could use them. They would not be sued if they used Tesla patents. Why? They believe that the entire ecosystem, including Tesla, will uh, benefit from a rapidly evolving technology platform. And this is best achieved by sharing. And sometimes the best ideas are already within our organization. We just need to set them free. One company that's had a really interesting approach to this is Adobe, the software company. And it had a kind of whole idea about allowing people to take hold of the innovation process internally. How do you unleash the entrepreneur within your business? How do you unleash the entrepreneur within your team? Well, Adobe's idea was this. They came up with something called a kickbox. And it literally is a box. Um, it's available to all employees, uh, and it basically is an idea that takes them through the innovation process, from prototyping, testing, iterating a concept uh, with as little corporate overhead as possible. So you open up the box, and inside there's a credit card, it's loaded with $1,000, there's Starbucks vouchers, but most importantly, there are tutorials that take you through the innovation process. The company doesn't ask for receipts, there's no follow-up, there's no time limit, Employees have to become the CEO of their idea. They are in charge, right? They allocate resources and they spend money in the way that they see fit. And a lot of the, the time when it started, a lot of people in management were like, well, what is this? Is this really going to work? What if people just spend this thousand bucks on, on whatever it is they're going to spend it on? What if none of, the, one of the, um, none of the ideas work? There were huge risks involved with this, this, with this process. But the executive in charge of this process kind of turn that argument around. He said that if we cannot accelerate the pace of innovation, that is the risk, right? The risk is that we won't exist any longer. You have to give the time and the money to people within the company in order to, for them to innovate, in order to, for them to experiment, because the chances are, if you give people in your organization that kind of opportunity, they will rise to the occasion. And it has to be an emergent, a self sort of like driving um, Process. So money and Starbucks vouchers aren't the only thing inside that box. This is a kind of like a six-step guide to the innovation process. And it goes something like this. I'm really kind of paraphrasing this because I'm running out of time a little bit. But it's just basically a, 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 question, sorry, a series of questions you go through. So the first one is, why do you want to innovate? What are you doing this for? What's the point of it? What's, your, what's, your, what's the, uh, the end point? Where are you trying to get to? The second is the whole kind of notion of ideation, right? So... Uh, you have to come up with ideas. The point is, coming up with ideas is work, right? There are no shortcuts, there are no miracles, there's no kind of bolt from the blue. So you get a little notebook inside and it says bad ideas. Because the idea is that at the first time when you first start doing this kind of thing, all the ideas seem like bad ideas. It's only when you work them through that they become good ideas. 
So there's a scored card, it's just the third stage, so you go through your idea and you evaluate it. Fourth is to test it, right? So you're testing the idea, they build a website just to see if there's demand. They then, you know, build a website, go on Google AdWords, start trying to attract people to the website to see if actually there's any consumer interest. Five, will people pay? That's the crucial thing, right? The number six is, the, is, is infiltrate, and what that means is bringing the idea to the boss. Maybe they need to test it further. Maybe they need a little bit more resources. So Adobe is only investing $1,000 in each of these, these ideas. They only need one of these ideas to hit, and they will have paid for the entire project. Over 1,000, uh, sorry, more than 1,000 of these boxes has been, have been opened by people within the company. More than 23 ideas have, have, have been taken uh, further uh, by management and invested in. So we know, the point being of this, we all need to think about innovation within our own teams. We all need to be thinking about new ideas. We all need to be delivering them in fresh, fresh ways. So um, Ben Horowitz, the Silicon Valley entrepreneur and investor, he likens where we are with the internet to the very, very early days of the internal combustion engine. And the internal combustion engine didn't just lead to the rise of the train and then the automobile. It led to sort of like world-changing shifts. So the move from the, uh, the, the countryside to the city, the move from an agrarian economy to an industrial economy, the rise of the city, the rise of the suburb, the, the rise of the big box retailer, all these huge shifts. And I think we need to be thinking in these terms, right? These big world-changing shifts that we're going through. That's not happening in the future, it's happening now. It's happening at this very moment, and we need to seize hold of it. The purpose of every single piece of technology ever invented isn't the technology itself. The technology is invented for one simple reason, and that is human need. So fundamentally, I think we're going to continue doing what we've been doing for millennia. We're going to be educating, entertaining, exciting, selling to people through making really sort of deep, important human connections. That is not going to change, because fundamentally, it's not about the technology, it's about all of us. Thanks very much. <laughs>